Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which is a state church watchdog with more than 32,000 free-thinking members. We hope you'll join us. We're pleased to have as our guest today, Ben Sidron. He's a major force in the history of music. He's an internationally renowned jazz pianist and composer. He's a, actually a rock and roll musician also. He played with the Steve Miller Band. He wrote the lyrics to the rock classic Space Cowboy. He's an award-winning national broadcaster. He's a record and video producer, including the album Picture Him Happy. He's a scholar. He wrote the book There Was a Fire, Jews, Music, and the American Dream. He's an author, including his own memoir, A Life in the Music. He's a journalist. He's interviewed many people in the music business. And he's a dad to a second generation musical prodigy, Leo. And in addition to all of that, he's a Wisconsin native who is a near lifelong resident of right here in Madison, Wisconsin. But Ben Sidron is known all over the world, and he's worked with and interviewed many of the greats in music, including Van Morrison, Diana Ross, Michael Franks, Ricky Lee Jones, and Mose Allison. And now we will get to interview the great Ben Sidron. Welcome to Free Thought Matters. Oh, thank you, Annie. What a wonderful introduction. I'm, I, you make me sound so worthy. I love it. <laughs> Well, first I want to say, you actually were born in Chicago, but then yes. uh, grew up in Racine, and yes. you have adopted Madison as your home, even though you could have lived anywhere with your musical abilities. Right, right. So uh, why? Well, I met my wife here in the 60s, mm -hmm. and being in Madison in the 60s was a profound experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we left Madison, we lived in England for a few years, where I, I went to graduate school, and then Los Angeles, where I got into the record business. And thank goodness my wife had her head screwed on properly. She came to me one day when we were in L.A. and said, this is not a healthy place for us to be, to have a family, to be together. I was just getting into the record business. And in 1971, this was a wild scene, the rock and roll business. And so I said, uh, well, we can live anywhere. Where would you like to live? San Francisco, Seattle, whatever. And she said, I want to go back to Madison. And so we did. We came back here and uh, we've been here ever since. So very committed to the local life. Very committed to community and the idea of community. Um, I like to say that you have to be from somewhere. And one of the hard things today with the Internet and everything, which is from nowhere and everywhere at the same time, is people are more or less from Google or Yahoo, but they're not from a place. And I think place is very important. If you look back at the history of the human animal, place has always mattered. It determines a lot about your life and who you are. So I, I and my wife definitely are committed to this community. Well, and the Freedom From Religion Foundation was born here too. Which I'm very proud of. Well. That's why this is a special place. <laughs> so you are known uh, as a musician primarily and you've done dozens of albums and you've been toured the world. You've did projects in Spain and I think in Tokyo and, and all over the place and played with so many people. But a lot of people don't know that you're also a scholar. You have a PhD. Yeah, I have a PhD in American Studies, which is history, sociology, literature, that sort of thing. And my dissertation was published actually in 1970 as a book called Black Talk on the Sociology of Black Music in America. My intent was to teach, uh, but by the time I got the degree, I was already in the record business. I mean, I had been doing recording sessions in London when I was living in England. And after I got the degree, it just seemed... Uh, to make sense to go to LA and get in the record business, and that's what happened. So no regrets? I mean, you've, you've got to actually live your life rather than teach. Well, life. but that's exactly right. You know, at one point I realized it, it was such a, a benefit to be able to become the information and to, to share it from the inside out as opposed to study the information. And I was very interested in how music plays into society and how music in many ways determines who we are as individuals and as society. And you can study it, and you can read a lot of books, and you can have a lot of thoughts about it, but to actually go out there and at the end of the night try to get paid, just like every <laughs> other musician tries to get paid and travel and stuff, it was uh, a great, great opportunity for me. And so I'm not at all unhappy that I did that. Well, but that. you're now in the books. I mean, when people are studying American music, uh, and not just the black experience, which we owe a lot to, but you also have studied and written a book about 
our debt to Jewish music, to Jewish culture and... In well, the 20th century? Right, exactly. There Was a Fire is a book that really came out of uh, uh, my experience as being the artist in residence one year here at the University of Wisconsin. And when you're the artist in residence, you get to more or less invent a course, but the course has to be cross-listed in several departments. And so I came up with the idea of a course to examine how Jews from the time of the, when they were immigrants in 1880 more or less, to the present, have really uh, not just shaped the music business, but uh, shaped what we think of as the American dream. Like, uh, mm -hmm. what is it to be an American? And, and just one small example, you know, the quote on the base of the Statue of Liberty, you know, give us your tired, your hungry. Uh, that was a poem written by uh, a young Jewish girl, and that poem, uh, Emma Lazarus was her name, that poem really kind of recalibrated the American dream, just that little poem. Up until then, we weren't, you know, standing by, welcoming the, the refuse. Right. So uh, the Jews have had this sense of social conscience uh, from the beginning. And songwriters like Yip Harburg, yeah, I was example. just going to say Yip Harburg. Brother, Can You Spare yeah. a Dime, the and, first social And Jay Gorney, too. And Jay Gorney, absolutely. And a lot of them are secular. Uh, uh, I mean, I, they're Jewish, but secular. You know, uh, my... My experience is that we turn to religion uh, looking for some spiritual sustenance. And of course, we don't find it there. Uh, but if you are lucky enough to find music, there it is. There is the wellspring of, of, of uh, uh, compassion. I guess that's the word. You know, one of the things uh, that was in the, uh, the book was that there's this Jewish idea of tikkun olam, which is, means to heal the world, to leave the world better than, than where you found it. So I was thinking about how does a love song about a boy and a girl holding hands heal the world? Because that's what most popular music is. I love you, you love me, we hold hands. And then it occurred to me, you know, when the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. People don't care at all. But when a boy and a girl hold hands, that's a little moment of caring and that little moment of caring is healing given the indifference that is in the culture we live so in. So the 1880 wave of immigrants included Jerome Kern's German family, a, a Jewish family, and look what Jerome Kid, Kern did to American music. Showboat. You know? Showboat and Showboat. all of those. Uh, yeah. The, well, way, the way you look tonight. And, uh, yeah. Irving but, Berlin. And, uh, Irving Berlin. Yeah. whose story is fantastic. He uh, came to the United States when he was a very young boy, five or six. His only memory of the Pale of Settlement was watching his house burn down, the Cossacks had burned down his house. He came here, his father died. His father was uh, in the yeah. Jewish temple, but uh, uh, Berlin uh, went out on the streets and got into the record, the, well, not the record business, the song, this started writing songs, started pitching songs on street corners. Uh, his name was Itzhak Berlin. He changed it to Irving Berlin. And uh, yeah. he said all along, oh, and this is interesting. B people would ask him, what does being Jewish have to do with your success as a songwriter? And he would always say, nothing. I'm an American. Yeah. I'm writing American songs. Gershwin said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And one biographer said, said music was his religion. Right? Well, music's my religion. When yeah. I, I was bar mitzvahed like a lot of Jewish kids, and I didn't find any spiritual sustenance in the organization. They were more worried, and this isn't uh, peculiar to the Jewish religion, and religion in general is into the building and the edifice, the edifice complex, right? Hmm. Uh, but I fortunately found jazz at the same time. And I, you know, I was a young boy looking for meaning, and fortunately I found it in jazz. Yeah. So Ben, I thought I read something that you were playing at age six in some band. Did I read that right? Well, I was playing at age six. Uh, I don't have a memory that goes back before I played music. Really? My earliest memories are sitting in a piano. So I was obviously drawn to it for some reason. Um, I first uh, was in a band when I was 13, a little dance band. And then when I came to the University of Wisconsin when I was 17, I fell in with Steve Miller and Boz Skaggs, who, and they had a little band, and so I joined their band, and that was really the start of my professional career. So all out of Racine, Wisconsin, basically. You wouldn't think Racine would be kind of the nexus for being connected to, to jazz and music. Right? Well, you know, it's interesting. People who come to jazz 
come for very special and uh, spiritual reasons. Mm -hmm. And it often happens. I mean, there was no jazz around me. And none of my friends liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just stumbled on a, a record in a record store. And I saw the picture of these guys, and the lights were shining on them, and they were all wearing matching blazers. And I thought, well, that looks really cool. And I took the record home, and it was a jazz record. Mm -hmm. And I put it on, and I felt, it's the strangest thing, I felt I was related to these people. Huh. And I, you know, noticed that they were all black, and I realized that black is just the color. I mean, people are people. There's only one race. It's the human race. And so it was a great way into this whole idea of uh, community and, and spiritual way to look at the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you have an album that um, plays off the uh, story of Sisyphus. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. The record's called Picture Him Happy, and it, it's... It comes from actually a quote by Albert Camus, where mm. Camus wrote a, a famous essay on Sisyphus. So here's Sisyphus, he's pushing this rock up the hill, he never gets to the top, it keeps rolling back over and over, he's in the sun, he's, you know, he's suffering. And so uh, how do you, it's obviously a metaphor for our lives, that's what we do. We, got, we wake up every morning, we try to make the world a little better, it doesn't, not, none of our plans really work out, we have to wake up the next day. Do we get, how do you maintain your uh, focus and your energy? And Camus said the only way to understand this is we have to picture Sisyphus happy, not because he ever gets to the top, but because he's here and more or less has this opportunity of a life. So the picture him happy, the song is about uh, you've got to picture him happy, even though he's out there suffering, pushing his rock. Well, that's kind of how we feel around the Freedom from Indigenous <laughs> Foundation. We're taking these lawsuits and fighting, and it seems like we gain a little, but we lose a little. But in the process, yeah. we're having a great time. We transform ourselves. I mean, when you think about music, somebody can spend eight hours a day for a month, uh, excuse me, not for a month, for 20 years, 30 years, blowing through a copper tube right, uh, a trumpet or a mm -hmm. saxophone. At the end of 30 years, the saxophone is exactly the same, nothing's changed, but the man is totally transformed. The process transforms us, and we think we're doing it for external reasons, but I, I, I think we're doing it to transform ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I play jazz piano too around uh -huh. Madison, and once in a while, yeah. maybe, I don't know, once or twice a year, when you're in the right band, mm -hmm. at the right time, with the right players, in the right mood, there's this, I don't like the word spiritual, but there's this gestalt or whatever you call that special feeling of transcendence that comes over you. Those are moments to live for, and they kind of put the whole world in focus. You've probably had that experience. Oh, yeah, and it doesn't happen that often. It happens a few times a year uh -huh. still. But uh, th that's interesting. I mean, what word can we use instead of spiritual? I, I'm, I would desperately like to know how to describe that transcendence well, experience. Well, we could say the illusion of transcendence or... Uh, because we're in the band, we know there's not a big capital M thing up there, but it feels like there's something above and beyond us that's more than the sum of its parts, you know? Yeah, and, and what I feel mostly, and the way a lot of musicians describe it, is I feel the music pass through me. Uh. I feel myself as being a vessel for this, and I'm not so much playing, but I'm watching my hands play, and I'm, I'm hearing the music at the same time as the audience. It's something about the ego falling away Mm -hmm. and the connection to a greater uh, consciousness. And if you were religious, you would, might call it God, but if you're secular, you would call it connection or community. A pro it's, or a pro it's definitely a process. It, yeah. It's getting in the flow of something, getting yeah. in the stream of something, and as you say, letting that be more important than you or yeah. trying to impress somebody with uh, how hard you practiced the day before or something. Well, it is remarkable how many musicians and composers will say music is my religion yeah. or theater is my religion. Yeah. But speaking of religion, you have been holding, I think you call them salons? Yes. And I had none about this. What, what are they? So uh, because I, I live in Madison and I like to um, do things in Madison for the community, the community meaning most often whoever shows up really. And so for the past 15 summers I've been playing uh, you know, little, uh, what do they call it, uh, happy hour gigs from five to seven at a, at a club. Uh, the clubs change, but the routine's always the same. Uh, I show up, people don't pay to come in, I don't get paid to play, and we just have this, and, I, and, but, and it's music and I play. 
and other musicians come and, and, and they get paid, we pass a hat. So uh, about five years ago, I started, and Scott Walker became the governor of Wisconsin, I don't know how many years ago, seven years ago or something. Seems like forever. <laughs> Seems like forever. And it was very, a very difficult time for all of us. Now, of course, it pales in comparison. But people were outraged, and they wanted a place to talk about it. And they didn't really feel safe talking about it in the general public, because you would uh, have to confront people who wanted to uh, beat you up, not physically, but mentally. So I decided I was going to put a, a, a poster up that said, Ben Sidron's Salon for Secular Humanists, Arch Democrats, and Free Thinkers. Mm -hmm. All welcome. All welcome. And it turned into a gathering place. It wasn't just about music. And so it went on with that name for about five years. And it became uh, just what the title said, a community center. And it, it wasn't rhetoric. It wasn't people arguing points. It was people coming together and having a drink and feeling part that they weren't feeling that they weren't alone. That's the bottom line. I bet you we knew more than half of the people who showed up there. I'm absolutely in sure this did. town, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know how we didn't know about it. I don't know either. But now you do, and hopefully yeah. next year we'll uh, we'll see you there. Well, yeah. before next year, aren't you touring in Europe again? Coming up this fall, aren't you? Uh, yes, I go I go to Europe every November. I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, because traditionally that's what jazz musicians do. They go to Europe and try to find a home there. So I've been doing that, playing in little clubs, not big theaters, playing in mm -hmm. clubs in London and Paris and Madrid and Copenhagen and Barcelona. And when you go there, you don't just play for one night. You get to play for four nights or six nights or seven nights. Wow. You get to meet people, know them. Uh, so I, I make this uh, an annual pilgrimage. So I'm on my way again. Yeah. Wow. And you get to try out your new music. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. You try out the new music, you see what works, you get to, uh, well, you know, I mean, the experiences often create new music. I mean, a particular situation, sometimes somebody will come up to you and say something that triggers an idea for a song. So mm. getting out there is, is really important. Wow. How many songs have you written? It's interesting you ask. I had to recently look at it. Over 300. Wow. I know. They just keep coming. I looked at your web page. And there's this huge list of albums. You know, just to do one album as a project, you've got dozens of albums, and then books, and then interviews, and then songs you've written. It just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls. So, yeah. Ben, uh. BenSidron.com is the museum of Ben Sidron. <laughs> uh, it does. It lists. Uh, so I've made 35 solo albums. Wow. I've produced 50 or 60 albums for other people. Wow. Um, and you know, to be honest. 95% of the stuff that I do doesn't make money. It's the other 5% that mm -hmm. supports the rest of it. And it's pretty much like everybody in the music business. Well, I think most businesses have their yeah. their cash cow and the rest uh, is the rest you do just it cause fun because you, you, you need to do it. Well, playing in, in restaurants, there's not much money in, in <laughs> restaurants. No, there's no money. And sometimes you can't even get them to uh, turn the background music off. But ah. that's part of the karma, you know? I mean, the the great people who came before us had to do that. I'm not saying it was right, and I'm not saying they wouldn't have benefited from more respect. What I'm saying is to get in the line. I feel like we're all in this long line. It's been going on for thousands of years, and we're all part of this march towards social justice. We're part. The arc of history bends toward dignity and freedom and justice. That's yeah. the arc of history. And so when I'm in a, in a restaurant and there's noise, I, I don't get mad at them. I think I'm just part of this process. But for some musicians, music is one of those things that you can't not do. You just, it's, you, it's like breathing. You have to do it. I have tried to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I'm glad you haven't. Now, we only have a couple minutes left. Before the show, we were talking about the times, the mm. hard times we're in. Yeah. Any words of solace or comfort? Well, you know, people, when... Uh, Trump first got elected, and of course, you know, Trump is a, is a symptom of something much mm -hmm. deeper. Mm -hmm. You know, he's an abscess on the body, and the body is not, not healthy. And people were suggesting that, well, because uh, it's so out in the open, now artists will come to our rescue. But it, the, the ground that we stand on has shifted so dramatically in terms of the ecology of how arts are supported. or. It's not like the old days where somebody would go suffer in a room and come out with a great work that would change people's minds. 
The only solace that I, I know works is community. Community, community, community. You have to participate where you are. You have to go out and vote for school board. That's how this whole mess started. It started with uh, Gingrich and, and, and Reagan and these people taking over the school boards and then taking over the local and take and the next thing you knew here we are so i the solace so is vote yes th th going to vote and getting your your friends to vote and telling people who don't agree with you you know they're not your enemies tell so them to vote so after the after the break uh, you have a song you've written about this uh, could, would you play us a couple of songs for us? I after? would love to. I have a song that I, I didn't write specifically for the foundation, but it's, it fits so beautifully. I want to do that. Well, thank you, Ben Sidron. After the break, we'll hear some music from Ben Sidron, the jazz musician. Uh, raconteur. Raconteur. <laughs> so stay tuned for more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. So here we are in Studio B with the keyboard and the microphone with Ben Sidron. And Ben, uh, you told us a few minutes ago that you have a, a song that might be like a like a theme song for I, I, this one's perfect for you. Uh, really? This is uh, a song that came out of the uh, Salon for Secular Humanists, Arts Democrats, and Free Thinkers, and uh, it's called "In the Beginning, Man Created God." Very good. In the beginning, man created God so he would not be alone or lost without hope and God became that hope for man and hope became the reason to believe that God created man as part of a plan that there was a reason behind all this trouble in mind Now billions of people believe with their hearts If they just hold out their hand, God will appear So they will not be alone, lost without hope Only to find they were never alone Only lost, lost in the family of man that was the plan all along. Thank you. Thank you. So in the beginning, man created God. He right? certainly did. Well, wow, there we go. All these different types of gods. So. All, the whole idea of God, something, <laughs> anything to be a buffer between us and the unknown. So you have another tune that we're going to go out with here? Yes. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This one is called I May Be Wrong. And it's kind of a look back at how uh, we all thought it was going to be and how it's kind of turned out. And uh, I guess the, the sense of this is connected to the other song in that 
we're not alone. Everybody's feeling this, uh, mm. this feeling we're having today. This is called I Might Be Wrong. Now, I might be wrong, but it sure seems to me The past ain't what it was and the future ain't what it used to be Oh, everywhere I go, I hear people say They say, man, you should have been here yesterday You should have been here before the fall Now it's the price of everything And it's the value of nothing at all oh, I might be wrong But I think those days Those days are gone The past ain't what it was The future won't be here long Now we're all just the sons of the Dharma bums Waiting in the water of the infinite flow And every time you take a look There's another dead guy in your address book Where have all the good ones gone? Why did they leave us here to carry on? I might be wrong But everywhere I go Them that knows don't talk them that talks don't know If silence is the answer What could the question be? We watch as time passes And then so do we Well, thank you, Ben Sidron. Thank you. You might be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong that you are a national treasure. It's a real pleasure having a national treasure on our show today. Thanks, Dan. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters because free thought matters.